ओके सो आई थिंक वी शुड स्टार्ट आर कॉन्वर्सेशन पीपल इन दी ऑडिटोरियम आई वुड अप्रिशिएट इफ यू कैन सेटल डाउन एंड ब्रिंग सम साइलेंस इन आर स्पेस सो जस्ट टू काइंड ऑफ गिव अ क्विक इंट्रोडक्शन प्रसाद हेड रिक्वेस्टेड टू इंट्रोड्यूस Oh. Am I audible now? Yeah. So, uh, Prasad had requested to introduce uh, all the conversationalists like a friend. So, my friendship with Marina goes back to 2016, when I came to know of her um, her project Bethur of Mosque. uh which was nominated for the aga khan award and also awarded the aga khan uh prize uh so that's when i came to know of her for the first time and in 2017 i had the opportunity of visiting dhaka for 3 days uh over which i got to know her a bit closely uh when i got an opportunity to visit her project in person um the independence museum and while i wanted to um actually look at more of her projects uh, i didn't have enough time because of the 3 days i was there one and a half days i was stuck in traffic so that's uh, that's dhaka for uh, for us uh, and uh, finally last evening i had the uh, sorry last morning i had the opportunity to see her in person so so that's how i came to know of her in reality and uh, over the conversation ahead i hope to forge <coughs> friendship through some debate and dialogue around your work and practice um so with that i'll leave you to explore her work uh in the pamphlet that is in your catalog in your uh, folders and i would invite marina to present her practice welcome well thank you my friend <laughs> was nice meeting you yesterday and well thank you for the invitation uh sea uh it is absolutely you know wonderful to be here and i'm really happy that i made the decision to come uh and congratulations again to the new gra- fresh graduates who are coming out of sea the first um, first batch <laughs> yeah yeah it is indeed a history uh making uh in the process uh, for the university so i mean for the institute basically so so yeah i'm happy to be here so um i am marina as uh, as you all know <laughs> i am an architect practicing in bangladesh uh i graduated from bangladesh university of engineering and technology uh in 1995 and 95 if you can remember those were the times when a uh, uh, development industry or so called real estate development was booming in dhaka and dhaka being one of the only cities where people are coming for different kind of opportunities so it's a city of migrants from all over the country opportunity migrants climate migrants all kinds of migrants so um so basically uh, the development sector really uh, was vibrant around that time so every single architecture office was busy designing developer projects so it was you know getting out of architecture school the first thing that hit me was architecture is a commodity but that's not what we are taught in the schools we are taught something else <laughs> like the students here are being um we are the things that we are bringing up now uh in conversation um that was not the conversation in the mid of 90s in bangladesh in dhaka so that kind of you know brought me to a sort of a realization that what is actually happening around the world where universities are not really um uh, focusing on perhaps so this is what it was this is how i saw the world uh, when i got out um you know instant vending machine where you just put the money in and design comes out within a few <laughs> months or weeks there is no sense whatever architecture is all about that was not there and you see china in the making and all the cities that has been growing in the last uh, two decades instant cities instant buildings instant everything so um so this fast food of architecture wasn't something i was really um agreeing with 
And so you had to take a, make a decision, like take a choice, like which way to take, whether will it be a, a path of resistance where you don't take part in this whole um, me, you know, me megalomania of architectural production, or should it be of that? So basically I decided to take a path of resistance and not to go that way and kind of decided not to work um, where architecture is seen as a commodity. So I was really not, uh, so that was a position I took and I still uh, hold back or still holding on to that position of mine. So this is what I started looking into. So this was again, after getting out of my university, my first search was understanding the land where I come from. Um, so, because to me, land is about the topography, the geography, uh, the climate that gives us in a way our uniqueness or in some way, a certain kind of an identity, the language we speak, the food we eat, or even the clothes we wear. So all of these is, is in many ways um, uh, influenced by our climate and the geography where we live. And so uh, that was an important point. And then there is, of course, time, which is a constantly changing variable, and it's evolving the culture we live in. So it's a transformative thing. And both of these, um, in a way, place and time together creates this context. And that context is an important part. So I would generally, as I do most of my presentations, I start with talking about Bangladesh. And um, yeah, so. I'm sure all Indians here knows quite well. Uh, I'm good. Yeah, uh, the map of Bangladesh because you definitely, while <laughs> drawing your map of India, draw Bangladesh <laughs> quite quite well. <laughs> so um, uh, it's a peculiar uh, line, though. Dilip, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> the line that was drawn quite peculiar, but you know that's what we live with. Um, so Bangladesh is crisscross. I mean, I don't know if you could call it a landscape or a waterscape. It has more than 700 rivers crisscrossing the entire landscape uh, or the entire land. And you see Himalaya on the upper, uh, in the northern part, and Brahmaputra and Ganges coming from these. And then there is the Meghna. So there's three major rivers, uh, Padna, Meghna, and Jamuna. Three rivers and then flushing into the Bay of Bengal. And while doing so, creating this land, two thirds of Bangladesh is actually uh, Delta, or as uh, Dilip would call it, estuary. <laughs> so if you see um, on that side, the blue one is a NASA map where you see how dynamic these rivers are, um, starting from, 19, and from 1971 till 2019, I think. You see how, uh, how dynamic the movement of the water system is. And on this side is an image uh, we've created of, of Lower Meghna, where we've done a bit of a research for the Sharjah Architecture Triennial. And in a way, this was also uh, one of the way of my first looking into that part of, the, of Bangladesh. So what you see as movement, if you go closer, this is how you see uh, erosion on one hand and emergence of new land on the other hand. So it's a constant play of erosion and emergence. That's how the delta is. And uh, so if you look at it much more probably, uh, so here on this side, you see how it sort of takes out. So this is mostly during the monsoon season when the, there is an enormous flow of water that's going to the Bay of Bengal. And you see how mighty the rivers are in that, in that region. And on the other side, you see new land emerging. These are the Chor, we call it in Bangla, the Chor areas, that's on the other side. And, um, and so these are cities that are being worked up, small towns, people losing houses, and there is no way of taming it. I remember when I was a student in school, when we had science fairs, and we made this uh, interesting thing about uh, rivers, how you can tame them. So we had this uh, uh, department called Nodi Shashon, Nodi Shashon Institute, which means River Discipline or Taming Institute. So they had formed something like that 
to, to the thought that they could actually tame this thing, right? <laughs> I mean, so that's how crazy it is. What happened? Okay, let's go to the next one. So um, for this research work, which was a, a commissioned research by the Sharjah Triennial, we looked into how people live. And so in February last year, we went to this new chore that has emerged in the middle of Meghna. And uh, so we went there and you can see what uh, Dilip was referring to when he talks about wetness. It is just sediment and you see how wet and so how, you know, how the land is basically being formed inside the river. And so here I took it from Dilip and this is how I kind of uh, constructed. And it's kind of interesting that Dilip started it in the morning and I'm kind of ending it <laughs> with the same idea that what he talks about, and I totally agree that this line that we draw on the on uh, uh, to distinguish between water and land is actually a designed line, uh, a man-made line, and which is absolutely something that is totally wrong in many ways. And you can see when you go through these places, you really feel that how it is an absolute water uh, scape than um, than land. So how, why does this happen? So we tried to look into geography a bit. And so um, here we, what we found out that if this is the Reynolds map and you see this is Ganges coming down here, and this was Brahmaputra. And then during the Assam earthquake, the Brahmaputra actually shifted its uh, course from this direction to bringing it here. So this is the old Brahmaputra and this is the new Brahmaputra, which is Jamuna here. And so these two rivers then flushing into the Bay of Bengal, taking an enormous amount of water. And that kind of creates this uh, flow during the monsoon season most of the time. So if you look at this area here in the lower part of Bengal, which would be the estuary of the Ganges. And so if you see these are the areas, these pink areas are actually the matured delta. So they are not moving anymore. Whereas these blue areas are the active delta. And why is this movement happening? Why the sedimentation happened? Uh, according to geographers, it is because it's a tide dominated delta. And because of the tidal flow, the water basically reverts back into the channel system. And so the sediment starts to occur. So that is one of the ways why sediment happens and then erosion during the monsoon. So that was something of an interesting thing. And then while we were researching into this geography and the ecology of that area, what we found out is that there are these interesting house forms. And these house forms you will find along the entire belt of Brahmaputra to uh, the Bay of Bengal. The reason is they are mobile. So when there is erosion, there is a crack in the ground, people know that there is, they have to move. So they immediately knock it down, take it on a boat or something, and move it to us in a much more safer location so that they can re-erect it. So it's a completely knockdown system. And if you see, takes a little bit of time, I guess. Huh? My files are a little bit big. So you see here, uh, so this is the knockdown system. So it is uh, actually made out of wood, wooden uh, framework, and then corrugated sheet because it's easier to maintain and to build with. And you see how they knock it down put it on a boat or a cart or something and then move it. So it takes about two hours to dismantle it and about seven days to uh, re-erect it. So that's a system that has been there for more than 100 years now. So you see that all along this belt. And what we found out that if you go towards uh, along the uh, Brahmaputra up to the Assam, you will see a similar kind of a house form because there is also this movement. So this kind of house form also exists around that area, which I haven't been up to. I've only seen to the Bangladesh part, actually. But if you go to Silet, which is also was part of Assam, you see this kind of house form also. Yeah, so this is that um, very mobile house form. And the Brahmaputra is so so there is, there are markets in Bangladesh. In some, there are some markets where you can buy these house forms. So they sell. So you, it's almost like a furniture. You order them, you can tell them how many rooms you want, they'll make it for you, and they'll take it wherever you are located, they'll go and make it, uh, erect that for you. So it's a very ingenious way of dealing with a land which is not moving.
behavior, which is not stationary, it moves, so the house needs to move as well. So that's a kind of a mobile system that people have already developed. Okay, so I have to move, I think. So um, the, the entire uh, triennial was focusing on the rights of future generation. So we have to see in a way that when the land is not stationary or it's constantly moving and uh, has this dynamism uh, about it, what happens to the rights of the people who live there? So that's what we tried to investigate. And that brought out a quite an interesting thing. And you know that's why I really like it, uh, like the idea of research, because it, as you dig deep, you see, you find out a lot of interesting things which actually may not be architecture, but it's quite uh, fascinating to learn about. So these land um, along this area, which have been there for a long time where the new sediment would come up. And these land, when the sediments or the chores came up, people generally would go use it, uh, do agriculture, raise their, graze their cows and cattle and everything. But there was no sense of ownership about these lands because they knew there they will go away. They will be washed away at some point in time. But during the colonial time, that's when you see these documents here. So that's a lease deed where the colonials actually mapped these uh, uh, these lands which were there, and they made so these are the draw these are the maps that you see of that land, which doesn't exist anymore. But they made they documented these lands. They leased it out to the locals to earn revenue, and when they left, they basically auctioned it to the locals. They bought it, and uh, so they were using it. And at some point, so this is both are the British time documents, as you can see here. This is the Pakistan phase document of the same land. And the deed is kind of going from one to the next. And uh, so this, this here you see, in, if, you, if you can read Bangla, you'll see it's written Tripura. So it, we, this area belonged to Tripura at one point. And now it's, it's under Kumilla uh, in Bangladesh. So this, when you put it on a current Google map, this is what you get. So the land doesn't exist, but the papers still yeah. exist. So the land is not there. <laughs> um, uh, so it's a, it's a kind of an interesting dilemma that what, what will happen around this area. So, so we basically followed one particular plot, which is this plot, the one that I showed you, which is right here, plot number 1862. And if you see, this has been going, going down from one generation to the next generation. Now it belongs to, two, these, to these two people. By the way, this is, guy is an architect and hoping the land will come back and he'll build something there. <laughs> and that's uh, one of his cousins. So now they are holding on to the papers, no land. And if you see here, uh, that dot, as, it, as you can follow, is going, gone, gone, gone. And then slowly now you can see that little shade coming back again. And that's where we were walking, uh, the, the image I showed you. And if you, if you see these images, this is actually showing how the house move. So the houses move seven, eight times. And um, one house we found, which is a uh, uh, 120 uh, years old house, and it has moved seven different locations and has survived all these different generations that has come along. So that's quite an interesting story. So what we decided that we will buy three houses and take it to Sharjah. If it can move from one location to another, it can move from one country to another as well. So we bought three houses and these are some of the drawings we did. So you see here that these are the kind of houses and this is what we took to Sharjah. And the Sharjah Triennial actually uh, gave us a site which is an abandoned school um, made in the 80s and quite often they tear them down, make new ones. Uh, so the, this, the triennial basically decided that they want to keep this as a triennial office and they would continue um, every three years to hold their uh, uh, exhibitions here. So they gave us this courtyard where we basically placed it. So this is the school uh, now abandoned and was supposed to be torn down, but then they didn't. And so this is where we took these houses. Three of my architects from the office and one carpenter uh, worked for about 15 days and they built it. So, um, 
So that's that. I think it's just finishing now. Uh, it's been there for three years, and we have in the inside, uh, we have all the uh, all our research uh, basically um, displayed there, so people can learn about it. And that's the city, and you can see, even though the houses are born out of a certain kind of a situation, it's not devoid of aspiration, which I find with these beautiful uh, decoration that people generally put onto the houses. And we decided that it should be there as well. So coming back, this is, as you can see, the beautiful picturesque uh, Shundarbon, uh, the lower part of Bangladesh, the Shundarbon is here. And um, one of my projects, which is again in the Delta, which is the Panigram Resort right here, which is very close to the Shundarbon. And the client basically decided that when they came to me with the brief, they said that it needs to be ecologically and environmentally friendly, uh, socially and environmentally responsible project. And uh, so uh, basically we went to the site. This is our site and if you can see, it's a very green, fertile land. Delta is very fertile in Bangladesh. And this is the area in Jasore where um, you know, the entire Bangladesh's you know, vegetables are actually grown. So the whole country is fed from this, these deltas. And there are three crops a year. So it's a very fertile land. And that's what you see. It's almost looking like Kerala, right? <laughs> yeah. So. So that's our site right there. That's a river, Koputakko River. Yeah, the, this morning we were talking about river being a male and a female. This is a male river because it doesn't have an offshoot. So it's a male. And generally when there is tributaries coming out of rivers, that's a female river. So we have that. So we don't call them, in Bengali, we say Nodi. Nodi is river. And uh, when it's a male, we call it Nod. So, so there's this distinction. So this is a nod. And Michael Modushudon Dotto, I don't know if there is any Bengali. Here he is, he lives, uh, his house used to be somewhere very close by. So that's uh, the view you get from the site. You can see all the farmland. There's a bridge over there. Uh, the entire area is just farming. So you see paddy fields. And in the winter season, it's all mustard seeds. And so beautiful yellow, uh, picturesque. And still cow carts are there. You can, you know, there is no technology in that sense, except for the uh, very uh, local natural technology that you see in the morning. If you wake up, you'll find um, a jam of cow carts going to the fields. So that's the kind of landscape it is. And so when I went there for the first time as an architect, seeing the site, I am born and raised in the city of Dhaka, never been to a village before or you know, maybe for a very short picnic or day trip. But I, I don't have a village home in that sense because my family comes from Malda. So we are immigrants into the Bangladesh. So because of that reason, we'd never had any, um, in that sense, uh, a village home. So my connection is entirely with, with city. I'm a city girl <laughs> going to a landscape like this. What do I build here? My education in architecture did not prepare me to build anything in a landscape like that where nothing has been touched yet. So how do you make a mark? What do you do? So that became kind of a dilemma for me uh, to start with. So in a, one of my first uh, visits, this is what I wrote. Rural Bangladesh, uniquely beautiful, a soul of the Delta land. It feels like a crime to invade the silence with the roaring noise of architecture. It really was something that I thought was not right to, to, to bring in my knowledge and to put it there. So the idea was to learn from the land. So what is the wisdom of the place? And so what we did is we tried to understand what it is, how people build in a place like that. How can we make the minimum of intervention uh, to create something? So if you look at the landscape there, it's a flat land because it's a delta. There is no up and down, so it's a very flat land. So what do people do when they build something? The first act of building is actually a landscape act, which is to dig a pond. So they generally dig a pond 
right here. Uh, and so they create a certain kind of a ground. And with that earth, they create a mound, as Dilip was mentioning in the morning, that, that on the mound, then they place the houses. So what happens is you have a higher ground and then the water recedes from that to the rivers, to the ponds, and then this is your homestead and that's where you put the water. So if you see, it's, that's how it's all created. So these are all just dug out ponds. And so you see here, a dug out pond and that's the homestead where all the houses are placed. So this is how people have been building um, in a flatland, which is kind of a very ingenious technique if you can think of. And so what we did is we started documenting the entire villages uh, surrounding our site. And we um, looked into how people built the houses. So when we were there for the first time, the villagers thought we will come and make a city out of it, 10 story buildings. They were very excited about a city going to be built in a, in a, in a village named Tahirpur. That didn't happen because we went and we inquired about how they build their houses. And they were like, you know, why do you want to know how we build with mud? And we said, we, we want to build mud houses. And they said, no, these are for poor people. This is not where rich people live. So there was this idea, uh, there was no pride in how they live and how uh, in a symbiotic relationship with nature that they live, which we understood and they didn't, or we had the understanding and which we thought, they thought that it was a poor man's way of living. And so there was this conversation, constant conversation that used to take place with the villagers while we were documenting their uh, land. This is the program of a house, as you can see. These are the different elements that you can find in a household. And um, so these elements are generally placed around a courtyard. So it's not a distinctly defined courtyard, it's just a space. And all the different elements are just placed around it and placed in a way that it leaks from one space to other. So basically all these courtyards are linked with one another. So it's a very socially, communally connected space. And so all the house, all the villagers are quite, uh, quite nicely connected. And so this is one of the villages, which is the potter's village in Hindupara. And so you can see the potters have much more larger uh, courtyards where they need to dry their pottery. So that's how they build their courts and the, and the entire fabric gets created of the village. This is one of the uh, potters, Nimaipal and his family. And this is a bamboo weaver's village, the Dashpara. And, this, and you'll see that the bamboo weavers generally have their, even when they do the inheritance of land, they divide the lands linearly. And the courtyards are generally very elongated because the bamboos have elongation and they need to work with bamboo. So it's always an elongated courtyard. So these are only things you can find out when you actually go into the land, you talk to people and you try to understand how they live. And the other thing that is quite unique in Bengal or was, is this roof form, uh, the Bangla roof. And this Bangla roof you don't see anymore. It's a kind of a pitch roof, which is again um, curved. And uh, the reason is it takes out the water immediately as it, uh, as it, uh, rains and this was, this is also something taken by the Mughals and you see also these form being repeated in the temples of Bengal as well. So that was something we thought of reviving. So these are the textures of the site and that's our site. We decided that there was one road which is coming from that side. That's the river which is Kopotakko and there's another one going through here which is the Boirab. And so that's the site we had. Initially, before going to the site, we had a kind of an idea which is much more architectonic. While we did our survey, it turned into something of a much more, much more informal in many ways. And, and so this is what we kind of came up with, um, huts uh, that will be built by the villagers. And so these are mud huts with uh, about 30 inches thick mud wall. Um, the construction would be mud wall and uh, the roof is thatch roof uh, with wooden frame and uh, bamboo. And so we basically tried to create these courtyards along the hut areas. And so basically these are the rooms, the bathroom and connected with a veranda. 
Um, and what we did is we employed the villagers who are living in that area to come and help us build it. And so in a way to generate a local economy, but at the same time, um, creating this connection with the locals who are there. Because quite often what came up in our conversation with the client is how are you going to put a boundary? The line again. <laughs> and then, well, we have, we have on two sides the river. We cannot put a, a boundary around the river. This doesn't make any sense. And why would you have a site on, a, on the water, right? And then um, the rest of the side where we had land, um, it just didn't feel right to have a boundary wall. So we said, why don't we include the villagers so then they become our boundary. So you extend your um, site limitation outside of the site and you include people. So there is a certain kind of sense of ownership. That's why we wanted to connect with the locals and to start building with them. So this is one of the younger generation from that area. Um, he is a uh, Pal uh, Potter's son, uh, did his studies in the villages uh, till did his uh, higher school uh, exam and then wanted to go to the city, maybe to Dhaka or some other town to start uh, his career, maybe in the lowest level. So we decided or we talked to them and we said, why don't you work here for us or with us and let us try to build this thing together. So he definitely has no knowledge about pottery because to him, pottery doesn't earn enough money. So he never learned. So the skill never got transferred from his grandparents or to, from his father to him. So what we did is we asked him to connect with his older generation. There he is. And we started getting the uh, product designers involved. And so they started creating these interesting potteries. And so there was a connection that was basically created. And uh, so they got involved. Uh, the construction system, we basically went for sun-dried mud brick that you can find in the brick kilns uh, before they put it in the fire. We just uh, took it from them and uh, mud mortar and the entire thing is absolutely mud. This is a, quite a big project to be built by the local technique. So we employed uh, sun-dried mud brick and mud mortar. And so you see, this is how it's constructed. We have, and the other thing what we did is we have these guys who actually are the only people who know how to weave with the thatch. Uh, there is no more, you can't find them anymore in, in Bangladesh. There's only two team you can find in Chatkira who are able to actually weave this entire, uh, this is called Golpata, a kind of a palm leaf, which you can find in the Shundarbans. And there's only a certain time of the year when the government allows you to cut it. And that's when we procure and we stored and then later on used it for the roofing. And women uh, do the best plaster, actually. They're the best plasterers. So all the buildings are plastered by women. And so, um, so this is what uh, the buildings actually look like, uh, entirely built by the villagers. This is this, the side of the river. That's Koputako, and you can see the, uh, the houses uh, basically on a higher ground. This is during the monsoon. This is absolutely the amount of water that comes uh, during the monsoon season. So it won't go above that level. This is during the dry season when uh, there is no winter. I mean, there is no rain. So this is entirely built by the villagers, actually. Um, I can't claim any credit <laughs> except for, I would say, designing the process and being a manager. So what we did as, as the project was coming to a completion, we, this, uh, we created this Panigram Community Initiative. Panigram is the resort's name. And the community initiative does quite a lot of work, actually. Uh, they do craft diversification workshops where women and men from the villages are given uh, uh, more, uh, in a way, through workshop, some new skills or understanding so that uh, new products can be developed, which can be then sold to the uh, not only to the guests um, in the resort, but also can be exported. So we also work with another company which exports handcrafted products. So we are also working with them. We've created this savings group, which is quite interesting because women save money every week, $1 each. There are 25 women in one single group. So there are a couple of these groups. So women 
actually save money and they've been saving for the last three, four years now. And so they have quite an amount of money and they have an, a bank account where they actually save entire uh, and they keep a record of how much money everybody is contributing in every week. So from that amount of money, they are now giving themselves loan and they decide who should get the loan. And then with that loan, they are either uh, fixing their kitchen or making a new toilet or making a new house. Uh, so that's also something of an interesting process that was introduced. But this is something I borrowed from uh, an architect who actually works in a city which is very close, a small town which is very close to the site, about an hour's drive, Hasibul Kobir. He lives there and he calls himself a community architect. So we have a group of community architects in Bangladesh who basically goes and works with communities. So the community architects actually helped me uh, through this process. And the process basically starts with mapping. So I'll show you the project next. I mean, the one that uh, in Jinai the Kobe did. So it starts with a mapping process. Then the villagers or the locals whose house they want to build, they make an aspirational model, like what they want to have. And then they work with the architects uh, who then help them uh, with the understanding of how much money and the budget they have. They create something. And so this is the village that they actually, it used to be a very dilapidated shabby state. So they created a certain walkways and everything. And, and so this is one of the houses that was built with $1,500. So it's a $1,500 home project, two-story building. So this is also a project that I gave. Uh, I mean, this was my studio in Harvard GSD when I was teaching there uh, that designing a $2,000 home. And so what is $2,000 in a village term? It is three cows and a goat. That's a goat, not a dog. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so my students actually came to, uh, to the site. They visited the site. They went and saw these houses and um, basically also trying out all the different materials that are there uh, available to be able to understand what the extent of the materials are. So they were really working very, very hard trying to build all these different things. They also, we, we selected five different clients. So they went and sat with the clients, understanding their aspirations, uh, making models and sort of really trying to understand. So it's a, we, we call this process a co-creation. So it's a co-creation, meaning that you have to take the aspiration of the people in mind. So that is the first thing that their aspiration has to be met. And it's quite interesting that they don't want mud houses, they want brick houses. And as architects, we might think, oh, mud is so beautiful, why would you want to? So, you know, we, we can be very um, uh, ignorant or can be, uh, you know, don't understand what exactly what their aspiration or why they're looking for it. It's actually having a brick house changes their social status. And, and which means they can marry their daughter better or their son can have a better wife. It's a kind of a moving up the ladder of the social strata and which is very important for them. And that's what their asp aspiration is. So in a way, uh, we had a lot of critique from many people, like why aren't you suggesting mud as a material? And we said, this is not what they aspire for. And quite often as architects, if we want to make ourselves useful to the people to to give our knowledge or share our knowledge or our ability with the people of the villages, it's important to understand their aspiration. That's what I learned through the pro entire process. So, so that's what the student actually did. So this is one of the students, uh, GSD. This is where they are basically talking to the client. And then we had an exhibition on, uh, on site uh, in the village and they decided which house they want. <laughs> so there were five different clients. Each student had uh, one design. So there were two students or three students designing for one client. So they basically decided. So the distinction that the student got in our studio by our colleagues was not the design that was chosen by the client uh, in the village. So that was quite an interesting learning as well. <laughs> Okay, so these are some of the images of the students trying to work with pottery and how to make a breathing wall. And here they're working with brick and tin 
uh, trying to do uh, whatever is possible with $2,000. And uh, my office, there was an engineer and an architect who painstakingly sat and calculated if this was actually possible in $2,000. And this is a book that came out after study from the students' work. And so, yeah, so that's something you can, uh, it's already in, the, in online, you can read it online. So during the Venice Biennale, we decided to take the Bengali courtyard um, to Venice in Arsenale. This is Arsenale, and we were given a site right here. So free space, what we found um, in the text quite interesting was choreographing the daily life, um, um, going beyond the visual and choreographing the daily life. So to us, courtyard was actually a very a, a space which is kind of a free space. And um, what my learning from this project was about the wisdom, wisdom of the land. So that's what we called it, that in a time like ours, where we are so flooded with data and information, um, we're losing the idea of wisdom. And so in a way, from information then comes knowledge when we are experiencing something and knowledge over time uh, becomes a certain wisdom and that wisdom kind of stays on with the land and that is something we also need to uh, keep in mind. So uh, we, is that my time up? <laughs> no, okay. Um, so uh, I have quite a few things to show, so kindly bear with me. Um, so yeah, so what we did is we went and took all these different elements that a household actually uses and you can find in the courtyards. We took them from the north of Bangladesh to south of Bangladesh. We asked people to donate and so they did. And so this is these are granaries you'll find uh, in the North Bengal made by these women. And so, so we took one of these and placed it in Venice that you can see there. We took a grinder. I just saw in your project that you also have something like that, right? That's quite an interesting thing, right? So this is a grinder, um, dicky as we call it, yeah. So we took all of these things that I'm sure you'll find a lot of these elements quite similar to yours as well. We are one uh, land anyway. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so basically we took all of these and we placed it, we created a courtyard in Venice. This was our site right there. And so we took it all and made a Bengali courtyard. So this is our courtyard. You can see all the different elements that we sourced are uh, there. And we created the houses with only lines. So basically, you don't see buildings anymore. They are kind of invisible. But uh, you see the basic wisdom, which is uh, about the grafting of all the things that you can find. So that's Claudia, uh, a friend of mine, <laughs> after a long walk through the arsenal and she decided to kind of take a rest. So um, going to the other side of the uh, Bengal Delta, which is towards Chittagong, uh, that's right around here. Um, uh, as you know, Bangladesh quite often gets hit by a uh, cyclone. So one of the cyclones that hit in 1999 uh, in April, uh, that was a uh, category five hurricane and um, it, uh, it struck quite heavily. It's one of the last centuries, one of the heaviest and the uh, one of the deadliest cyclones that that was that happened in that area, especially uh, close to Chittagong. And um, uh, the site that we were work we are working on at the moment, um, at least um, I think about forty thousand people lost their lives, and altogether it's about one hundred and thirty eight thousand people who. Well, were washed away or lost their lives. And there was about six meter high uh, surge that happened from the, uh, from the Bay of Bengal. So the Bay of Bengal is here and our site is right there. And that's about 2.5 kilometers. And so there's an embankment that was built here. And I think there's another embankment right around this area. And uh, this was built after the cyclone. And then the government also made some rules that if you if you build around the coastal area, this has to be elevated to a certain height. And uh, there is a lot of cyclone shelters being built because people generally built uh, very fragile structures, which just gets um, washed away with cyclones. So 
we have cyclone shelters. Quite often, these cyclone shelters are used as schools. And so the client um, uh, uh, didn't ask me to design a cyclone shelter. <laughs> it, it's a mosque. And so the site they bought is right here, right outside the embankment between the first and the second embankment, not on the other side. So this is the site we had. And the client came to us uh, with the idea of building a mosque. And uh, it comes from a very different kind of an idea that can a mosque be used um, as, a, as a space which is not only for prayer, but also for other activity. And for the activity that they suggested would be a health hub because there is no health facilities around this area. And so uh, we were asked to to have a health hub where primary health care will be given um, and then immunization for children. So all these different activities uh, would take place. And the reason for the mosque is because they wanted to try, try it as a pilot project where then they would, there are so many mosques dotted around Bangladesh. They wanted to add this health hub with uh, mos already existing mosques. So, but they had this land, so they wanted to test it uh, as a first project here. So this is the site where we started looking into. So mosque, um, um, how do you <clears throat> kind of uh, uh, looked into the, I mean, I, I really had a long research on mosque because of the other project I did in Dhaka. So coming back to that, um, this is one of the Mughal mosques <clears throat> in Dhaka where uh, there is these two different layers, which I found kind of interesting. The lower level is uh, is more, a place where people generally stay, or it's like a, creating a, an elevated platform. Uh, it has a stair that goes up, so there's a courtyard on the top, and the mosque sits on it. So this is the lower level of the mosque here. And this is a hospital that was built by Louis Khan in Dhaka. And so I really love this labyrinth of structure that he built. It's a, um, um, it's a hospital which is for heart, uh, yeah, I think heart, no, it's a heart, um, what do you call it? Cardiology, <laughs> yeah. So that's the hospital for it. Uh, so basically, um, I've always found this quite fascinating. And then how to merge these two, that became a kind of an interesting way of dealing with it. So what I tried to do is we, we use the lower level uh, here. We created an embankment on the side and then we took the lower level as the um, as the health hub where people can come and gather. And in the upper level, we created the mosque space uh, with the courtyard. And so this is uh, what we are suggesting, and it's going to get built, uh, going into site uh, construction uh, very soon now. So this is the lower level where you can see uh, these are the different uh, spaces for for the um, health. And then this is a central space, which is like a lobby, the stair that goes up. And this is the mosque area right here. So, yeah, so that's the plan. And the reason why we kept it very closed is because of the wind surge, that when, it, when the wind hits, it does not, uh, if you have glasses, it generally breaks. So we created these channels to create, bring in the wind flow, but at the same time, uh, not to have uh, any openings on the outside, but the openings are more in the middle of the structures. So that's the mosque here, that's the courtyard on top. And so these are the, I would say, a community of rooms or volumes. <laughs> so um, a bit of a Kanyan approach, I must say, before anybody else says it. <laughs> and so, um, so it, it has these long uh, double height ambulatory spaces, the courtyards. So that's a sectional image that you can see some of the images that we created uh, yeah, to show the client, uh, the courtyard. So the circle bringing in and that. And so the brick um, has a long tradition in Bengal because of the fact that it's a uh, delta. We don't have any other material, no stone, nothing. So we just have earth. So for uh, architecture of people, we build with mud. And when it's architecture of power, we build with brick we bake it so that it's much more permanent. But nowadays it's much more permanent, everything. So we are building with bricks since the second century BCE. So 
This is one of the monasteries, uh, Buddhist monasteries uh, in the north of Bengal. Uh, so that we have quite a lot of these Buddhist monasteries dotted all around Bangladesh. And so we have really good brick masons, uh, fantastic brickwork, good quality brick. Um, so many of my projects actually have these kind of a brick uh, architecture. This is a very small house close to the mosque project um, where we've also tried out brick. And one thing I would like to talk about is this central void. Quite often you'll find in my architecture, I always have this void in the middle, uh, which actually works to create this draft of air and ventilation um, around the building. Um, so what happens is it creates this stack effect where hot air moves up and then air from sides generally come in to fill up the spaces. So quite often I have these kind of uh, spaces in my architecture. So this is one of those projects where you have this large volume of courtyard. That's the courtyard where I grew up in as a child. And that's a courtyard I built uh, uh, after becoming an architect. So quite a lot of arch um, courtyards uh, you'll find in most of my projects. Um, Tropic of Cancer cuts through Bangladesh. So it's a subtropical climate. We basically, if you distinguish between the climate, there is a dry season and a wet season. And dry season we build, wet season we design. That's how we do it. Uh, so, so in a way, the temperature difference is so moderate that you don't really need anything. So if you extract, you know, take away everything, strip everything, then this is what architecture is all about in Bengal. This is a painting, Bangla Ragini painting, where you can see that all you need is actually a roof to, to, uh, to shade you from the elements uh, and a plinth to raise you above the ground from the water. And that's it. That's architecture. You don't need anything more than that. No skin. Some student worked on skin yesterday, <laughs> no skin. <laughs> and so this is the first architecture of Bangladesh, uh, modern architecture, I would say, uh, by Mazarul Islam, um, our first architect uh, in 1954, uh, the Art Institute. And uh, I think in a way that building sets the modern uh, architecture in a very appro appropriated modern architecture in Bengal. And so that kind of creates a benchmark and a very beautiful building. I think nobody has been able to surpass that till date. So that is a beautiful architectural um, example for us to follow. And in many of my projects, um, I've tried to employ that same thing about how you can open up the edges, um, blurring the boundary between the inside and the outside. Um, so it's a flexible thing. You can close it off if you like or keep it open. This is a project we did a long time ago um, in 1999, 2000. So it's a, we call it a pavilion apartment, one of my first projects. So that kind of sets the uh, tone for the way we worked later on. This is again, another building where we open up the edges if it's a 12 story, 14 story building where you can still do that by opening the skin on the sides. So the skin is there but um, it is a ventilated skin where you, you make it breathing. So that has been an obsession for me, like how you can make your building breathe. Building must breathe. Um, otherwise, if you build a, when I see a glass building, I talk, said that to Kenneth Frampton as well, that to me, it's a, it's a building on life support. The moment you take it out, it's dead. So if you want a living building, it has to be breathable. It needs to breathe on its own. So that's something I have worked on for a long, long time. This is again one site in the city of Dhaka, a residential project, which is now undergoing um, the approval process. This is a, you know, I'm sure we are all used to these kind of long veranda houses along the tropics and the subtropics where this, this is like a double skin, where this is a very important space, which is used during the daytime I remember my grandmother's house where we used to most of the time spend time on the veranda, long veranda, sitting there chatting and talking. The room was only when you go to sleep. Generally, people never used to stay in rooms. They were always occupying these outdoor or semi-outdoor spaces. That's where life was lived. And for because of this commodification, we don't have this anymore. 
you don't see verandas. It's an extinct uh, element from the households. So that's something I tried to bring back in this project where we tried to create these verandas all around the building. And we have this shaft, which is actually creating the draft of air all through. And so the building actually is almost like a, so the, the veranda actually creates the skin of the building and you have the courtyards and that's the living spaces in the middle. So that's now under approval process. So if you want to vegetate it, you can do that too. That's just an idea. So those are some of the projects in the city of Dhaka. I'm just going very fast, so don't get bored, please. And I'm, I'm running out of time, long time ago. So, <laughs> so uh, okay, so that's Dhaka growing uh, on, the, on the Buriganga River. And you can see how densely built it is. It is uh, like Mumbai. Um, uh, 20 million people in 300 square feet of area. That's our normal. That's also our normal. And the normals are sitting next to each other. One is the lower income and one is the higher income, but that's the city. Uh, that's how it looks like. The density is one of the highest in the world. So it's a, one of the fastest growing cities as well. And so one of the projects right here is the Museum of Independence that uh, Anuj was mentioning he visited. So I'm just going to go very quickly with that. This is a project. You can see the city. That's our uh, parliament complex. And you can see how densely built the entire city is. So if you can map the green areas or the open areas, these are the spaces that would be. So this is actually one of our sites um, because it has a history. It used to be a racing horse racing ground during the British time. And then be, d during the Pakistan period, it was a place where all the political gathering used to happen. And, and so this is the 7th March speech by Bongo Bundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman that actually triggered the war between Pakistan and uh, East Pakistan and West Pakistan. And on 7th, 16th December, this is also the same ground where the allied force of India and Bangladesh, um, I mean, the Pakistani surrendered to them. So it, it has a history. And so the history goes back long, right? Uh, that's the map of the Hindu population, the Muslim population, and how this entire uh, subcontinent was divided. We all have no, we all know the history, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, Bangladesh's history is from 47 to 71 is of a very turmoil um, between the two parts of Pakistan, East and West. And then obviously the independence that happened in, in December 1990s, 1971. And in 1997, there was this competition, uh, which was held between uh, in a national competition where we won first prize and we were asked to build the project. Uh, we were just out of school in 95, 97, which is like two years out of school. And then you win this really huge responsible project to build was, uh, was an enormous responsibility, I must say. And, but I think we were, in our own capacity, we tried our very best. Um, so that's the site. This is an already existing uh, children's park. And so the site, what we had, we tried to keep as, min as minimal a footprint as possible uh, and to, to have that as a museum. Uh, so what we did is, since it's a park and there was no architectural anything, so we decided to go for a non-building approach. So it's a non-building approach. It's just a plaza. There is no museum, but the brief said that there has to be a museum and a, uh, and a tower monument. So it's a museum of independence and the tower of independence both together. So what we did is we created this plaza and then we placed the tower on top and we took the museum below grade. The idea was that freedom, dream, aspiration has a preferred direction, which is upwards, like anything that um, is uh, searching for infinity generally takes an upward leap. And memory sadness generally urges for the subterranean. So we wanted to take everything in, in so that it, you know, sadness is always something within you and laughter you share. So that's the, that is the museum below grade. So it's a very non-building kind of an approach where uh, you see the tower over there. Uh, the building, uh, the project entirely took us 16 years to finish actually um, because of the political uh, reasoning, I mean. So yeah, so I'll just go through the images to show you 
So this is the area where we have all the different images and, and the story uh, all through. And then there is this dark area where this, the genocide and the killings are basically placed. And then you enter into this central space where there is this water column which has light from the top, uh, the oculus, and that's a space, more or less a contemplative space where people generally just gather and uh, contemplate for a while for the people who were lost. Uh, so that's when you go out. Um, and then this is the Tower of Independence where we use glass, but our material was actually light, not glass. Uh, we use glass because glass can hold light uh, in a way. So these are glass stacked one top of the other and then cladded onto the uh, tower. This is one of the images uh, right after when the sun goes down. This is what you see. And at night, this is, um, uh, it's lit from the outside. So you get a, um, so it's some kind of a beacon of hope. That's how we saw it, that we call it Alo um, Stombu. Uh, this is 16th of December. Okay, so the last project, and then you're free to go. <laughs> my grandmother, um, so she uh, is the client for my project of the mosque. So she uh, donated a piece of land uh, to design this mosque. And she was very formal about um, giving me the commission. She invited me for a cup of tea. I went there. She had her drawings opened. And then she said, this is the piece of land I want to donate uh, to build a mosque and I want you to design it. So that's how the story, and I, I had to take it very seriously and I accepted her um, uh, commission. And so um, one, uh, on I think in 2006, in September, we went and had a groundbreaking ceremony under a jackfruit tree. Uh, so it was still a very village-like atmosphere. It's on this, in the Northern part of Dhaka. So, um, so everybody gathered and, and she basically declared, you can see her sitting there, uh, declared that um, she's donating this land for a mosque. And so that's the site. And this is the city of Dhaka. That's the, north, that's the southern end where the Buriganga River is. And that's another river called Turag. And that's the site. It's absolutely at the end of the city limit. And so uh, the, part, this, the site has actually over the years changed quite a bit. Uh, it used to be a kind of a farmland, agriculture land, and slowly started to be much more of a settlement as migrant people coming from different places started buying small parcels of land and started growing, uh, building houses. So uh, I could see that it's a space which is going through a transition. And then, of course, the research on mosque, what is actually a mosque? And that took me back to the first mosque of Islam, which is actually this, what you see. It's, uh, it's built out of a house form in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, especially the Prophet's Mosque was actually a house form which was then elongated and then made into a, a longer space where people could congregate. And so if you want to, what is a prerequisite of a mosque? You need a clean space, you need the right direction, which is called Qibla towards Mecca. And you need, if it's a congregational prayer, you need an Imam. Anywhere on earth can be a mosque. There is no prescription for it. And so the first mosque of Islam didn't have any domes, no minarets, no symbolic, uh, anything attached to it. It was a basic space for congregation and that's it. So as Islam moved from the from Arabian Peninsula towards north, towards east and towards west, it took many different forms. It actually adapted the local culture, local construction techniques, and uh, the local climate. So it has taken many different forms, as you can see, um, from all different places. This is India, as you can see. This is Tunisia, China, uh, Spain, uh, Mali, Turkey. So all kinds of different forms that you can see. And in Bengal, this is what we had. These are the first mosque forms during the Sultanate period when Islam came into Bangladesh or Bengal. So this is what it is. Um, and this is what the mosques are now in Dhaka city, stacks of floors. I don't know how people go there, what, what kind of prayer it is really. How can it evoke a sense of um, spirituality uh, within a space like that? I really don't know. And this is what has happened to the symbols, as you can see, uh, the dome and the minaret. Um, and then I really kind of question, do you really need that um, to symbolize yourself, to identify yourself? 
or is it much more deeper than just symbols? So I kind of decided to go towards um, spirituality as an element. So I looked into light, light as an element, and you can see there are so many beautiful examples all around the world, how beautifully light can be used to evoke a sense of spirituality. And so that's the site. Um, it has a direction which is towards Qibla. It, uh, to, get, to make it um, in the direction of Mecca, I need to move about 13 degrees. So this, and the site was like that. So this is one of my first sketches. So if this is the site and that's the prayer hall, it needed to be shifted. So I introduced a circular volume to help that shift. And so taking from the older architecture, and then that's the first conceptual drawing that I came up with. So as you can see, the models. Uh, so that's the prayer hall, actually. The prayer hall is actually, if you can remember that image I showed you of Bangla Ragini, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pavilion, basically. It's on eight columns. It's a pavilion. And it's wrapped with brick all around. And the wrap wrapping is quite porous. So that's the prayer hall in the middle. And that's all the brickwork I can, you can see. Very uh, porous and load-bearing. There is no structure, uh, no concrete except for uh, the prayer hall. These are the sections. And the other thing is my grandmother, uh, as I showed you that image uh, in September, she passed away that same year in December. So uh, she didn't get to see it and I was left with an enormous responsibility of um, finishing this project and in a way to fulfill her the promise I made to her. So I kind of, um, had to raise funds from all different places. So I became a designer, manager, builder, fundraiser, everything for this project so that I can bring it to completion. So these are our craftsmen uh, from the North Bengal who are the best masons in Bangladesh. So they are the ones who made the project actually. Um, you know, you all, of, all of you know this from Ahmedabad. And so, you know, you can't do this anymore. It's so beautiful, but unbuildable, I guess. So we decided to do that in brick. So Jali, so you can see the site now. It's all construction going on all around and that's the mosque sitting there. And basically it, at one point in time, you won't be seeing it anymore. It's all be filled with buildings. And so the facades doesn't really make much of a sense. What you need to look is within, not without. So, so that's the idea. Uh, we worked on. So again, another construction. And that's the outside, that's the inside of the prayer hall. Very basic, very basic. There is no finish. Uh, I didn't have the money to, to do anything finishing wise. So I used light as an element because light, as you can get for free, doesn't you don't need to pay anything except for some nice sections to deal with and then that's it basically light is the ornament of the space and uh, throughout the day and uh, the summer day you see beautiful play of light and in different times of the day different times of the year it plays quite differently so uh yeah so this is during the summer months and after the award, we had a nice celebration. We used the space of the mosque as it is for prayer, but also for other activities. So we had a nice dinner, lunch, actually. Right after the prayer, everybody put together this uh, nice setting. And then we had a nice biryani, um, which Dhaka is quite famous for. You should all try when you come to Dhaka. And so, yeah, so I finish it here. Sorry for this long uh, talk, but <laughs> thank you. to talk to her <laughs> but while probably uh, the audience is warming up I would like to kind of uh, uh, clarify probably yeah. uh, three aspects that I had kind of in mind when you were preparing and what we see in uh, your your journey uh, in your architectural journey is that your earlier projects um, uh, and and most uh, many of your projects have a very strong kind of um, 
uh, drawing from the modern masters that that uh, left a legacy in Dhaka. And uh, I, I just wanted to understand that how it plays out today. Uh, what are the uh, what are the leftovers of modernism, and how do they rework into your eventual newer projects, which are trying to work with community? So this idea of you know the uh, the 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 architect being the master form designer to the process designer and I think that kind of completely shifts uh, the way in which one imagines of architectural practice. So how, how does that renegotiation happen? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean uh, the thing is um, there's so many aspects in projects and I generally take each project um, uh, differently. So when I'm going to a village, working there, I'm trying to address the, you know, the questions that, that are raised, in, in, or I'm raising myself, so I'm trying to cater to that. So n there is no formula for one single formula for every single project, I would say. Um, they're all quite very different, but quite a few things that I'm always trying to address is one, uh, how we can involve the community, which is, I would say, um, from that uh, project and the resort project when we started, that's when I started uh, working with that. And also, that's also something we employed in the mosque project because the uh, project also uh, involves the community because they are the ones who are funding at the end. So basically, and, and I think that's so important because if you uh, want to create a sense of ownership among the people who, are, who will be the final users or who will be looking after uh, a project, it's very important to create a sense of ownership. And the only way you can do that if you, is if you can actually involve them in the process and while building it. So that's something I employed. But that is not to say that, uh, that the, the, but the language of architecture, I mean, there are quite a number of things and they all come together at one point, right? So there's the climate, the site, the program, those are all the things that you address, but at the same time, the language of architecture that I definitely, you might say, I have uh, drawn from uh, whatever is there. The, this history, uh, and history doesn't only belong to the, uh, to the ninth, uh, to the first century, second century, but it is also my modern history. So I, I would take anything from from all of that. But one one can see that it's also getting morphed in the recent yeah. project of yeah the, uh, the, the morphol. I think the mo yes. morph is a must. Yes, and otherwise it becomes quite cliche, doesn't it? <laughs> And the other interesting aspect that I also observed is uh, the, your engagement, your constant engagement with the artisan, the uh, and not art. I would say artisan because I think uh, uh, because art also has its equal amount of ego as the architect. The artisan kind of allows you to dive into wisdom and uh, accumulate many wisdoms into the project. And in that process, I wanted to understand what are the new negotiations that uh, the architectural practice undergoes in, um, in your works? Yeah, well, I think um, you just have to keep a very open mind while designing, a very open mind. So uh, when you keep yourself open and you're receptive towards ideas and whatever is coming to your palate, um, you just uh, include or you know, create an analysis and you include some of these things. So there's a process of inclusion, keeping a very analytical, uh, you know, you have to be critical about what you are including. But there is a process of inclusion, I would say. And, mm -hmm. and then if you are an open-minded architect who is uh, ready to, to take that in and not really close all your doors and just do what you think you mm -hmm. know better, um, I think that that is something is so important I, yeah. as I, I feel at least at this point in time in my career. Yeah. And in that trajectory, would you be willing to forego form completely? Uh, which one? Uh, the architectural form that you. Know. I haven't. I think. No, I don't I, think I'm asking if yeah, you would I be willing to willing completely to forego. I did right in the in the resort project. It's mm -hmm. not mine mm -hmm. in any way. Yeah. Uh, I took, uh, well, we, we probably have d designed uh, small sketches about how the rooms and the bathroom could be, mm. but then the rest of it was, you know, whatever came up as, mm. as a way of building with hand, anything that came up, we were happy with it, and in a way, I took a back seat in that mm. project, not right. really, uh, so it depends on what the mm. project brings in, and, and it's a kind of a balance, right. it, it has to be, 
you know, architecture has certain agendas mm, also. Mm, mm. Uh, the yeah. quintessence of architecture yeah. has to meet a certain agendas where you can call it architecture or not. So those things I, I yeah. think I'm kind of uh, right. careful I, I about. I think that's very interesting in the South Asian context particularly because one is that it allows to diffuse the, uh, the image of the master or the hero architect who kind of is the god on site and kind of diffuses it into a, into a kind of communitarian practice, uh, architecture as a collective practice uh, and not as something that is kind of directed by one singular person. The last point I actually wanted to kind of uh, uh, ask you uh, is, um, you know, and, and that is kind of drawing from uh, the first presentation today um, uh, and in, in some sense bookending also uh, this conversation uh, from the Lips uh, presentation when he was saying that, um, that uh, uh, I would like to recommend uh, architects to actually uh, uh, draw from Bangladesh uh, when they are responding to water. And, and I was thinking that uh, it's only in recent times that, um, uh, I mean, there is, uh, last year when Doshi received the Pritzker, finally, he was the first South Asian architect to receive a Pritzker and that too at the fag end of his career. And that's when the attention towards um, architecture, architectural, architecture of South Asia kind of really um, uh, takes emphasis. and. Um, uh, what I was thinking was that we were just having a discussion at our school that when when the Pritzker was kind of uh, conferred upon, that uh, that it's only uh, in spite of of the Pritzker coming, it it almost feels uh, uh, almost tokenistic uh, because because how many of uh, uh, how much of Indian architects or South Asian architects would be uh, asked to build an international building outside of the South Asian context? You know, and that's still kind of something to question. And, and I was wondering that, is it because of the way in which we position our building constantly through culture and context? And is that a limitation? Because uh, are we kind of creating a boundary in positioning our building? Because our context, uh, our context and culture and climate is extremely specific. And we are constantly kind of framing our buildings around that and theorizing our building around that. And does that kind of, um, in some sense, foreclose, our, uh, foreclo foreclose opportunities of taking our ideas beyond this context? I don't think so. Not at all. No, I think if you look at the new premise, <laughs> new, I mean, in the new premise, or the, there's a shift. Uh, you must understand. There's a lot of shift that's happening. And we had an exhibition called Bengal Stream, in, uh, which happened in, uh, started from the Swiss Architecture Museum, then it traveled uh, in many parts in Europe, in Germany, um, uh, in France. And people are actually investigating, probably after Doshi and quite a lot of these Aga Khan awards as well probably um, includes to that, that what is it that South Asians are doing that is right of this time? Because we've been pursuing this for a long time, right? The, that which uh, West is probably now looking at mm. and trying to investigate. So I do not think we should move away from what we do um, and, and just, you know, uh, and you know, what I think is important is to, s to understand what is right. Mm. What, which is the answer which is the closest to being, you, there is no right answer or wrong answer in architecture, but at least you can go as close as possible to becoming, uh, you know, giving the right kind of uh, attitude. So, uh, so if we can keep to that, I think the West will definitely come to us. Okay, with that I open to the audience and uh, there's a question in the oh second God. last row. I will let the back, uh, uh, the younger audiences kind of speak the for front benches, in the beginning I'll and see then you, uh, take in the, questions for dinner. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a question uh, uh, right below the cameraman. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dhruv Nashit, uh, a final year architecture student from Academy of Architecture. So I've read an article online beyond the critical regionalism in which Kenneth Frampton mentions that the mosque designed by you is one of the great examples of a, critical, a critically regional building today. So what, according to you, are the parameters that would define your most critically regional one? And, and uh, like, is it just cult cultural context or is it something more than it? And like, what is it 
that gives it a sense of place to the mosque. I think you should ask Kenneth Frampton, right? <laughs> I think Frampton has amply kind of spoken yeah. about it. Uh, maybe we can actually go to another question. Megha. Uh, we'll talk later. Uh, no, okay. Okay, since the mic is with you. Yeah. Uh, I'm a recently graduated architect. Uh, uh, having visited uh, Dhaka last year as a part of my dissertation on uh, research on sacred spaces, uh, I have a few questions generated out of curiosity. Uh, so, how important is um, site study uh, if you uh, look at the Beitu Roof Mosque uh, and looking at the context in Rajabari, the village? Uh, and um, what uh, is the purpose, I mean, obviously, the, the courtyard uh, the, on the four sides and uh, considering the climate in Dhaka and how much it rains, uh, is there a possibility that it could lead to a little um, flooding inside the main prayer hall? And, uh, uh, sorry, one, one more question. Uh, uh, again, the Beitu roof, uh, how do you access the roof for cleaning? Just in case, and uh, regarding the Museum of Independence, uh, could you explain a little bit on how that the water column um, was? Is there some kind of threading that was done because okay, of how of technical questions? <laughs> Construction. The roof you just climb. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they told me, but I didn't believe them, so yeah. I thought I'll ask you. And. And as it rains, I mean, you know, it, that's the problem of our Western education because everything has to be reached with a stair which is uh, uh, ergonomically correct and it has to be um, of this size and this uh, uh, standard, the trade has to be this, uh, riser has to be that. Mm. It, that doesn't, how, it's not the way it works actually, mm. it's, it's, not, it's not that, um, at least not in the, in the project that we built. We had a very small budget. And, and, and the roof, uh, we get it cleaned uh, once or twice a year. And for that, to build that, uh, another stair would be a waste of money. So people just generally climb. Um, there are ways to climb it. <laughs> I can show you. <laughs> Maybe I'll send you a video. Yeah. Um, and it's basically before the rainy season starts, we do a cleaning and, and the glass that's there on top, we base, put the silicones and whatever is necessary to do a bit of a maintenance on the rooftop. That's right before the wind, monsoon season starts, that's when we do that. And it's just maybe one or two times a year that you need to access the roof and so that's not necessary. And it rains, definitely it rains uh, on the corners that you've seen. Yeah, yeah it's open yeah. to sky. It's necessary for the ventilation, so to keep the space ventilated was far more important than s closing it off for a, a few drops of rain well, that would come in and splash. It ge generally doesn't splash, I never got any complaint like that. Uh, so it has a guard on the side, so it doesn't really flood in that sense. Um, yeah. Uh, well, and the guide, you want it? Uh, there yeah. is a very sleek guide to, to get the water down, okay. otherwise it would not form a column. Yeah. Water generally breaks after a certain height, <laughs> yes. it breaks. Because so we wanted to create a column, that's the reason why yeah. we have the guide. Because it was just so perfect, the, the yeah. water column. Yeah, there is very thin nylon ground. Yeah. And just one last question, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the Museum of Independence, uh, it's right op like just near the, the National Museum of Dhaka, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and uh, most of the people surprisingly don't know about this, the Museum of Independence in Dhaka when you ask them. Uh, so is uh, the entry into the Museum of Independence that dilapidated gate and then you enter through the forested uh, garden and then it opens into the, the plinth which is completely exposing you uh, and then you enter the museum. Is this all planned, I mean, by the architect that's you? <laughs> and uh, yeah. does this have an impact? Well, it's basically uh, the government runs the museum, yeah. and so um, I think they are going through a phase, which is called, which they call the third phase, which is actually taking out the, uh, the the children's park, and they are recreating an entrance from that side. So that was okay. actually uh, originally that was the idea that you'll have the entrance from that part, but then the government decided not to take away the children's park. But that now they've gone into the third phase where they are actually doing that. So once they create that entrance, it will be far more visible. Because of the trees, you don't see that anymore. Yeah. And, and so the government doesn't have that control over it. So 
it is there a lot of people know about it many people don't yeah. um and in a way it is kind of tucked away inside the yeah. uh, inside the and that was definitely not the intent of the architect <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you okay i know there are many questions uh, okay. but uh, we are absolutely out of time and uh, really sorry so about that. um we'll have to really close um but uh, i think we'll have marina around for some time and you all can kind of uh, interact with her thank you so much marina for a thank beautiful you. Thank you. Uh, portfolio of works and thank you all uh, for uh, uh, joining us for these five conversations um i would now like to sh uh, like to uh, invite shreyank to close the ceremony and uh, uh, give a vote of thanks sorry again sorry well uh, it's a it's a tall tall order and humbling uh, you know uh, moment to summarize after five brilliant and such strong works uh, i must say i'm not nearly as experienced as any of them in kind of tackling these subjects but i've been asked given the task by prasad like what he does uh, <laughs> to summarize uh, the day, summarize the day for everyone so i'll try my best so please bear with me uh one of the things that i found that ties all the work um and i think that's uh, probably uh speaks you know uh, much better uh, rather kind of uh, which shows how powerful the idea of wetness is that it kind of holds all the five presentations together in a very interesting manner and uh, conceptually it does so many interesting things but if you just take the five uh, presentations today uh, right from zuzana's uh, you know coconut water where bacteria need the coconut water and feed upon it she opens up the microbial realm uh, where the wetness is so prevalent with marina uh, jondu uh, and of course your your work kind of opens up the deltas where we kind of most of humanity is living today uh, and in anuradha's case it's so subtle but it's also it's terri it's terrifying but it's so subtle that the reeds uh, that grow in that arid region in the camp themselves become the building you know? in, in that sense it's that minute amount of water that is required to grow those weeds and clad the mud onto those uh, camp buildings kind of you know really s say a lot about this concept of wetness in that sense that ties all the five uh, works together uh, without taking uh, too much time um, i thought i mean in in, in some sense to summarize um, this you know uh, the, the day uh, it's like miniaturizing their miniaturized presentations further into smaller something i might as well written a tweet and kind of gotten done with it however uh, i i thought that maybe it would be nice um, to kind of open up <coughs> the scales of objects that the five presenters kind of have uh, put forward uh, for us i mean while dilip opens up the planetary scale no that's kind of the imagination of the whole world and everything that is made in this planet is nothing but minute what uh, you know water bodies of varying intensities and densities and i think that was uh, quite uh, revealing in that sense at the scale of the uh, settlement and the cities i would instead of going to john do I'll, i'll think of anuradha's work because the question of citizenship i think kind of really uh, 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 and its relationship with the city is problematized uh, at the scale of the settlement uh, in anuradha's case much more powerfully with the uh, well you know recalling a gambens uh, category of bare life and and the uh, way subject would gets uh, c uh, constructed um, you know in in a stateless uh, condition and at the scale of the building uh, we just saw this marvelous work where every project is kind of conceptually tried to located in the larger landscape of this uh, dynamic and you know wild delta that you know where the, where this practice is kind of situated and what is interesting in marina's case is that the it it appears that the delta is no doubt informing the local wisdom and practices of building but it seems that it is also informing your practice as well uh, to kind of borrow from dilip's work again that i think it's a very nice example where water is not just cut out as most architecture is kind of uh, supposed to do that line that you kind of in this uh, on the surface 
but with I think what these practices and what Marina's work also show is how water kind of comes in, folds in, moves out, sometimes let people kind of take the building with them on the boat and stuff like that. I think it's an interesting way uh, of how these practices have informed your own practice to kind of, uh, at the scale of the objects, and I want to invoke John to here, uh, I know uh, your work is at the scale of the city and it's fantastic uh, with all the statistics and stuff. But I think what I found fascinating is that one of, the, one of the interesting arguments that you're making is to tell the stories of the cities from uh, the people who have kind of faced the impact of the, well, whether it's a developmental process or it is the changing economy uh, of, or the political economy of the country. You're also telling uh, the stories of how objects structure life uh, at the scale of the ho uh, home and the house. I think I found that very, very fascinating in that sense that while you know, you're working with municipal governments, uh, the municipal corporations, uh, local governments, but also you're working at the scale of the object, that by tweaking objects, somehow you're able to uh, fold in affordability, equity, well-being. And I think that's, that's an interesting uh, possibility and, and potentially has, uh, has great potential, I think, for practices across South Asian contexts in that sense. And I think at this realm of the unseen, the, you know, the unexplored, is where John Du's kind of uh, microscopic realm kind of becomes really, really interesting where we are in some sense finally come to terms with engaging with non-human life form to participate in the process of design. It's just not just communities <coughs> or objects, but it is this kind of non-human life forms that we're able to now kind of you know work with and engage with to kind of produce new design forms in that sense. So that's my summary for the day. And I think I'll invite, first of all, thank you so much. And <laughs> I'll invite Prasad to end the day. Thank you so much. One minute. Last one minute. So thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, the speaker. Thank you, th all the speakers, Dilip, Juan, Juan, Susanna, Anuradha, Marina. Uh, thank you, the sponsors, uh, StoneX India, Sri Ram Granites. Um, thank you very much, the staff and the students and the students' council of C. Uh, we need to clap for them. Actually. That's because because they 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 really they they were the ones who who put things together. Um, thank you, Nehru Science Center. Uh, Thank, thank you all the trustees for generosity and wisdom and all the friends who've come from all over the country uh, and thank you my wonderful, wonderful colleagues uh, uh, who carried the whole thing actually and, 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 and with, with very, very limited resources actually. So thank you. We'll find ways of meeting again. Uh, we'll uh, figure out uh, uh, newer... Uh, possibilities of uh, having continuing these conversations and having more conversations like this. Uh, but at C we do this on a regular basis, every fortnight. Uh, so all of you are also welcome at C, uh, uh, you know, uh, every, every fortnight. Thank you very much. <laughs>